محمد وعجل فرجهم رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة بسم الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عظم الله جورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بسيدنا ومولانا أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام وجعلنا الله وإياكم من الطالبين بثأره بين يدي الإمام المنصور المؤيد المهدي من آل محمد صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا أيها الحسن الزكي صلى الله عليك يا أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب On a night like tonight, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is cradled by the hands of his children with his head gushing with blood and his family observing the pain as the Imam alayhi salam approached Masjid al-Kufa tonight the orphans began to question, where is our father? And we respond back and say, tonight we are all orphans of Ali. أَمَّا بَعْدِ قُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي مُحْكَمِ كِتَابِهِ الْكَرِيمِ وَقَوْلُهُ الْحَقِّ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَى عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ صدق الله العلي العظيم <coughs> A second salawat in honor of Fatima al-Zahra Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayha A third in honor of the Imam of our time With your loudest voices Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shabib ibn Bajra, Wardan ibn al Mujalid, Otam bin Tashajna. Many of these names aren't so familiar to many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Although these three, and arguably including Al Ash'ath ibn Qais al Kindi, are the main perpetrators behind the death of your Mawla, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam. Oftentimes, many, if you were to ask, who was responsible for the death of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the common response is, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, al-Muradi. Or you might get the response such as, the Khawarij perpetrated and plotted against the Imam, and it was on such a night he was struck. But when you look into the folds of history, you find that there was actually a very intricate plan that was leveled to try for the sole purpose of assassinating and eliminating eliminating Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib that involved a series of events, series of events, multiple continents, and an elaborate plan that as a result made the Imam the Shaheed that he is today. If you were to ask any of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, how exactly did Imam Ali die? You'll get that Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim was interested in marrying, if we're being kind, we want to say marrying, being with this lady Qutam bint Shajna. And she had said that my condition and my mahar is the blood of the man known as Abu Turab. And due to his sexual desires, he proceeded and became the la'in that he is known today. The elaborate scheme behind the killing of Imam Ali is further than that. Imam Ali did not die the victim of some man's lustful desires. Rather, when you open the folds of history, as we will do today, 
And today coincides with that heavenly martyrdom. We will find that there were many involved. In fact, more than one continent came together to plot the martyrdom of Imam Ali. The following research assignment was conducted by a Sheikh Hassan ibn Farhan al-Maliki. Sheikh Hassan ibn Farhan al-Maliki is a Saudi Arabian scholar who is in prison today because of his research that he has presented, a non-Shia scholar. But he concluded that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, in his material, alongside the famous Syrian historian, Dr. Suhail Zakkar, died the result of an elaborate plan that involved multiple agendas for the following reasons. Geopolitical, religious, of course, and economic. How so? Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, in order to understand and appreciate how the first Imam of Ahlul Bayt and the second of the Thaqalain became a Shaheed today, you must first look back in the last five months of his life. It became the most arduous, tumultuous, pandemonium-esque circumstance you have ever seen in political history, whereby you have a man, imagine this one, imagine this, this one's ridiculous, a man whose own men separate from him, formulate another madhab, and begin to fight both him and his original adversary, Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. These were the khawarij. So what went on? Essentially, after the death of the third caliph, Uthman ibn Affan, the blame was leveled against who? Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. Why? And by the way, this is a synopsis which is absolutely summarized. It's much more comprehensive than meets the eye. Imam Ali, at the end of it, was blamed. Why? Because of your massive influence and because you did not want to give up the killers of Uthman, you had a hand and were responsible for killing God's third caliph, which is a big deal. And so they began to raise the shirt of Uthman as a symbolic gesture that we want to get the blood money for him. Ali, his blood is in your hands. If you remember, Islamic history, by the way, is very detailed. That Imam Ali, in this event, what did he do to save face? I am not the one, because I sent two of my children to stand in front of his door and guard him. This also led to some controversy. That why would Hassan and Hussein stand in front of the house of Uthman, his villa in Medina, and prevent those from marching inside and killing him? Those that came inside were fed up. They said, you are the least competent ruler. And by the way, the non-Shia also agree this. And I like to hear the distinction. As for religiosity, Uthman was very religious. You find him praying, worshipping, Quran. If we could get that door closed, please. If we, can, if we see him, Quran, praying, standing up, establishing masajid. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But as for politics, he was very weak socially. Why? If you look at the major leadership decision-making, he makes the imam of Masjid al-Kufa his cousin, uh, Al-Walid ibn Utbah. And Walid ibn Utbah famously prayed and led Salat al-Fajr drunk. And after finishing Salat al-Fajr, while he was drunk, he prayed it four rak'at, and he turns around and he asks the musallin, do you want me to continue or no? That's how drunk he was, essentially. And so people noticed this. They also noticed that he began to kill some of the Sahaba. Ubaidullah ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. He disagreed on the codifying nature of the Qur'an. Because it's during his time, Uthman wanted to codify the Qur'an. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen eventually gave the green light. But initially, Ubaidullah ibn Mas'ud, who's a companion of Rasulullah, disagreed. So that's not how you do it. The way you're doing it is wrong. Burning the Qur'an here because it doesn't match your narrative, etc. Hence why the Muslim world today calls the current version of the Qur'an Mus'haf Uthman. And so he had him beaten until he was killed. Until people were fed up. The political decisions were not right. And ultimately, Akan, the economy was weak. People were struggling. So they stormed his villa. Imam Amir al sent two of his sons, Al-Imamain. Why? Because later when he is accused, Imam Ali knows what to do, and he says, I didn't have any responsibility in this. Number one, Ahlul Bayt, that's not how we work. If we disagree with someone, we don't just storm and destroy and kill, even if they took our rights. That's not how we work. 
We don't chase bloodshed. We want justice. But there is a system. Furthermore, you can't just walk into anyone's house, even if you disagree with them, because if he has his family, and there's a rule of hijab and not hijab, this is going to violate the rules of Allah. Some might say this is little compared to the big crime that was committed. At the end of the day, don't look at the size of the sin that's being committed. Look at the size of the one you're sinning against. So Imam Amir al says, I didn't have any responsibility in this. He was just a poor ruler. They continued to blame him. Two primarily personalities popped up. Aisha bint Abi Bakr assembled soldiers and gathered in Jamal, i.e. Basra. That's where I'm from, by the way. In Basra, there was a research effort done. My uncle actually was part of this campaign, whereby they excavated the land known as Az-Zubair, which is in south of Basra, between Safwan and Basra Center City. Az-Zubair is just an open piece of dry land. There's nothing built in it. He says the archaeological museum conducted a research effort, and he was part of that. He is a, part, a journalist in this regard. My uncle, Sayyid Haider al-Jazairi. He went forth, and they said, we began to dig, and we found old pieces of metal from swords and arrows and armor left there. And we began to research this. You can even find the publication put forth by the museum then and there, which indicated that a battle took place here. And there was the maqam of Amir al-Mu'mineen in the masjid of maqam Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he first taught Kumail ibn Ziyad, Dua Kumail. The masjid is there. It's preserved. If you ever make your way from there, it's very nice to visit, where the battlefield of the battle of Jamal occurred. Because here you have 10,000 people dying. And so the remnants is still there as they began to dig and research. After that conquest, after that battle finished, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was the second figure that emerged. He came forth and he used the same excuse of the shirt of Uthman, similar to how the brothers of Yusuf used the shirt of Yusuf, faking the blood, stating that you had a hand and you are responsible. The wolves killed Yusuf. He is no longer here. They used the same thing, but with Uthman, you were responsible, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. The war begun. It's in this moment do the following decision-making lead to the death of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. How? Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen assembles his capital from Medina to the city of Kufa. Why would he make such a very radical decision? Medina is the capital of Islam because Imam Ali is Islam. He can make these decisions. Furthermore, Kufa is more strategic than Medina is based on where he is. His adversary, Muawiyah, is in Sham. And Muawiyah says, I will proceed. Muawiyah has about 500,000 soldiers. And this is a massive amount of men. All of them bloodthirsty. All of them obedient to any order Muawiyah makes. Imam Ali had less than even half of the half of that. Very few. In fact, less than about 20,000 soldiers were loyal to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. But it was with 20,000, he won the Battle of Jamal. And the Battle of Safin happened. In the 38th year after Hijrah, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen understands Muawiyah is proceeding to Kufa. And that's a shame because the, the nonsense idea of here are two companions, they both love each other, and they both will go to Jannah even though one wants to see the other's head spilled on the floor. And the sad thing is, it's not just Imam Ali. You can brush that off with Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is a leader and he's politically making decisions that don't fit. But why Hassan and Hussein? Because they're also fighting with their father, are they not? How about Ammar bin Yasir? As which in Sahih al-Bukhari, Rasulullah says, Ya Ammar, taqtuluka al-fi'atu al-baghiyah yad'oonahu ila al-nari wa yad'oona Ammar invites them to heaven, but they're inviting him to hellfire. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, clearly. I remember seeing some say that it's not the case. Ammar bin Yasir fought with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he did get killed in the battle of Safin. News broke to Muawiyah that he remembered that what happened. Rasulullah promised that it's the wretchless, heartless, evil group that will invite him to hell, who will be responsible for his death. So the response came back, I didn't kill him. Rather, it was the man who sent him that was behind his death. Ali is the one responsible. Why would he send him to war, knowing he could die? And so the response came back by Imam Ali. Then Rasulullah killed Hamza because Rasulullah sent him to war in the battle of Uhud. That's a nonsense reply. 
You are the, the one responsible. In any case, this battle takes place. The following is an interesting moment. Muawiyah notices that the forces of Imam Ali are making a lot of progress, despite their few numbers. And don't worry, even if the numbers are little, so long as Lulfiqar is in the field, you don't have to worry about how many men you have, how many you don't have. It's totally normal. You're, you're safe. You're in good hands, inshallah. But he's noticing that Malik al-Ashtar, Imam Ali's top general, is making too much progress. It's only a number of minutes, and then Muawiyah himself will be done. So he concocts a plan. He says to Amr ibn al-As, and he says to his vicegerent, Sir John al-Rumi, and he says, we need to do something to stop his men. Let's take each and every one of the soldiers a Qur'an, place it on a spear, and stand as one wall with the Qur'an raised as such. And we call out, let the Qur'an judge who's on the haq or on the batil. Last minute decision. They do that, some men alongside Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen become doubtful. Why? Because they see the Qur'an and they're saying, we are here and we just want the Qur'an to be the judger. They're thinking, we're fighting him because we believe he is the kafir and fir'aun of Allah on earth. So why are we fighting someone calling for the Qur'an to be the furqan between the right and wrong? Approximately 9,000 of Imam Amir al muminin soldiers throw their arms down as such. What did Imam Ali do here? Imam Ali, as you know, only participates with the men. He does not just stand and give orders. He gives the orders while being in the field as well. Imam Ali tells them, pick up your sword. What do you think you're doing? They say, Ya Ali, he's raised the Qur'an on spears. How can we fight someone who's raised the Qur'an on a spear? One day the Qur'an is on a spear. The other day the son of the Qur'an is on a spear. One father does this to the Qur'an. His son does that to the walking, speaking Qur'an. Imam Ali says, Wayhakum, Ana al Quran al Natiq. How could you? I am the walking speaking Quran. Who how else do you know the Quran besides through my lips? They said, Ya Ali, we can't do it. So, so what do you want? Imam turns and he notices someone, don't forget his name. Al Ash'af. This is the first perpetrator that led to the blood. Al Ash'af. You know when you said earlier, Allahumma al an qatalat Amir Mu'minin, na qatil. Qatalat. What's the difference? Qatil is one. Qatilat, there are a few people that got involved. I thought it was bin Murjim. Abdul Shaytan bin Murjim. It's not him. He, and there are a few others as well. Qatilat, Amir al Mu'mineen. Al Ash'ath ibn Qais al Kindi is fighting with Imam Ali. And do you know what he says? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let the Quran judge. And he was very charismatic. Yeah, yeah, how could you? The Quran. Aren't we here trying to defend the Qur'an? Oh, they're holding the Qur'an. He convinced people with his whispers here and there. Sometimes shaytan comes in shayateen al-jinni, but he also comes in shayateen al-ins as well. And al-ash'ath was shaytan, al-shaytan, al-shaytan. Suddenly, 9,000 say we're not going to fight. And they raise their swords over Imam Ali's head. His own men said, stop. You stop right here. Let's see what they want. At least give it a shot. So the imam says, what can I do for you? are being told to do something and you refuse. Let's see what they want. Muawiyah sees this worked out. So what does he do? He says, let's follow through with the plan. Let the Qur'an judge. How? He says, I need the scholar of the Qur'an in my camp to go and study the Qur'an and I need a scholar of the Qur'an in his camp to go and study the same Qur'an and determine who's on the haq and who's on the batil. So what did they do? Muawiyah says, I will pick you, Ya Amr ibn al-As. You will be the one who studies the Qur'an for us. And I will see what Ali wants. Imam Ali says, if this is what we're doing, then let me pick my cousin Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is known as Hibr al-Ummah, the ink of the Ummah. Muawiyah and his forces say, no, 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 not him. He says, it's not your choice, I get to pick. They say, no, he's your cousin. He'll pick a bias, he'll make a decision in your favor after studying the Qur'an. Exactly what do they want? They want him and Amr ibn al-As to sit together and look at the Qur'an and they say, huh, if we see Ta'ifa has ikhtilaf with another Ta'ifa, fab'ath hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha, these verses in the Qur'an, send someone to represent that side and that side, 
they're doing ta'wil to the king of Tanzil and ta'wil. All of a sudden, Muawiyah says, no, Ibn Abbas, I'll choose who can rep- represent you on your side. Guess who he chooses? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari hated Imam Ali to begin with, even though he was already on his side. What happens now? They gather in a tent, and the soldiers of Imam Ali are just standing and watching. And the soldiers of Muawiyah are standing and watching, and they sit in the tent for three days, studying the Qur'an. What are they doing? Reading the Qur'an, trying to figure out who's on the haq, who's on the batil, just looking at the Holy Qur'an. Suddenly, Amr ibn al-As says, Abu Musa, forget Muawiyah and forget Ali. Both of them are on batil. Abu Musa is like, what do you mean? He says, I think both of them don't deserve this khilafah. In fact, I say it should be you. Abu Musa says, me? He says, yeah. He's like, why me? Says, Number one, you're older than me. Number two, you're well known among the people. Number three, you've memorized the Quran. I haven't memorized it. I think you should be the Khalifa. But under one condition, when we come out of the tent and we see the thousands of soldiers waiting for an answer, who they side to, you must disassociate from your leader and disassociate from Muawiyah. I will do the same thing after you. What do you say? He's like, okay. So the third day, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and Amr ibn al-As leave their tent. The soldiers are gathering. Imam Ali is there. Look at the bala on Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. He has to be put up. He has to put up through this. Abu Musa says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful. He has given us wisdom. And through wisdom, we determine the following. That I remove my love and disassociate from Ali like I remove this ring and I disassociate from him and Muawiyah. Amr ibn al-As, what do you say? It's a shock. You disassociate from both of them? I thought you were going to pick one of them. Abu Musa, what do you, uh, Amr ibn al-As, what do you say? He's like, and I disassociate from Ali like I disassociate and remove this ring from my finger and I put it on and associate with Muawiyah like I put up my ring on as well. Abu Musa's like, I thought we had a deal. He's like, to heck with you and your deal and your leader. It's always been Muawiyah. That moment, the 9,000 that separated said, you know what? This is nonsense. Forget Ali and forget Muawiyah. We are our own group and we don't have a leader. They became the Khawarij. This is the arbitration of Safin. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen tries his best. He's speaking to them. He said, guys, this is a khud'a. They're misguiding you. He said, no more. That's why the khawarij, in their aqidah, they don't believe in a khalifa. They don't have. Why? Because they hate both directions. And they split from the imam, and they go to the north of Iraq, in the land known as Nahrawan. And now the imam separates from his people. He goes back to Kufa. He doesn't have the amount necessary. Muawiyah slips death like that. And they separate. Now the imam has two problems. La ilaha illallah. Muawiyah on the west and the khawarij in the north. And a few riffraffs here and there in Medina and Mecca. And Basra as well. So he's in the middle and the heart of the storm. What does he do? This is Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. I believe his stress levels were this high. But Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen is always in control. He goes straight to Nahrawan and he begins to preach to them. He begins to guide them. He says, brothers, listen, you have been misguided. Let me reinform you. But they close their ears and they close their eyes like this. Why don't you even want to see the imam? Amyun, bukmun, summun. You don't even want to see him? Go ahead. In this case, it's like hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. You heard no justice, saw no glory, and you will never ever achieve the justice of Rabbil Alameen. After a while, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen gets word that his representative in Nahrawan was just killed because he showed that he was a lover of Imam Ali. He and his wife were slaughtered. How? They would see that a Jew would pass by and they would stop at a checkpoint. These checkpoint managers were the Khawarij in that area. So they said, what, what's your religion? He says, I'm a Jew. Your religion is Judaism? He says, yeah, please pass through. The next person, Imam Ali's representative in Nahrawan. What's your religion? He's like, I'm Shia, I'm Muslim. He's like, and who's your leader? He says, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And who's that with you? That's my wife. And she looks pregnant? Like, yes. And they slaughtered the both of them, and they threw them in the river, the Tigris River. Imam Ali got word of this. He didn't want to kill them at first. So what did he decide to do? Preach. When he heard this, he took all his soldiers to the north, 
and he began to face them in the battle of Nahrawan, his own former soldiers. Among them was Shimur ibn Dhul Joshin. Among them was a man known as Abdullah al Ibadi, who then formulated the Ibadiyya sect that you might hear about in Oman. It's a small sect. Among them was Abdul Rahman bin Muljim. He fought them. Later on, Imam Ali didn't kill the captives of the battle of Nahrawan, but he killed the captives of the battle of Safin and Jamal. Why? Because the captives of the battle of Safin. If Imam Ali lets them go, they will go back to Muawiyah and continue fighting. So Imam Ali gets rid of them. But the captives of the battle of Nahrawan, the Khawarij, Imam Ali, if he lets them go, they don't believe in a leader, so they'll just be free. And that's what happened. He let them all go. One of them that went was Abdul Rahman bin Muljim. Abdul Rahman bin Muljim is a unique person. His claim to fame was the following. One day, when Umar ibn al-Khattab became the Khalifa, in the second year after Hijrah, Abu Bakr ruled for how long? Two years. Umar ruled for how long? Ten years. Uthman ruled for how long? Twelve years. So 24 years, Imam Ali didn't have his right to publicly lead. He was always Khalifa day number one. Umar sent his representatives across the Muslim world. He sent Abu Huraira to Bahrain to represent him. He then sent Muawiyah to Sham. That's how Muawiyah got into power in Sham. Umar sent him. He also sent Amr ibn al-As to Egypt. That's the third continent. Amr ibn al-As sent a letter back to who? Umar ibn al-Khattab. Saying, Ya Umar, you sent us very far away. Egypt, there's no scholar here. Send to us a mudarris to teach in madrasa. This person needs to be a faqih and they need to be a hafiz of the Quran. And they also need to be a muhaddith that can report a hadith. Umar says, I'll send you someone who's intelligent, who's uh, almost like a mujtahid, an ayatollah. Who does he send out of all people? Abdul Rahman bin Muljim. This is found in Tariq al Dhahabi. Al Dhahabi was very firm against the Shia, but he records that Abdul Rahman bin Muljim's claim to fame was when Umar sent him to be the faqih of Egypt under the orders of Amr ibn al As. Amr ibn al-As receives Ibn Muljim. Ibn Muljim starts teaching the children Quran, teaching them hadith, teaching them about the Prophet of Islam, and he stays there. When Imam Amir al muminin then fought Muawiyah, Imam Ali called his supporters. Among them, Ibn Muljim came to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's side to fight with him. Later on, Ibn Muljim joined what? The Khawarij. When Imam Ali freed them, Ibn Muljim came back to where? Egypt. He stayed in Egypt. Muawiyah realized that Ali has just destroyed those khawarij. So the people that we had created to be a problem on him, to prevent him from attacking me, are now gone. So who's his next target? Me. So what do I need to do now? I have no more. The remaining soldiers with Imam Ali are loyal to him. Malik al-Ashtar, Mukhtar al-Thaqafi is with him, Ibn al-Tayhan. All of these soldiers are alongside Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. So now he's going to shift his attention to me. Not just that. Imam Ali has a representative in Azerbaijan, north of Iran today, by the name of Qais ibn Sa'ad ibn Abi Ibadah. Sa'ad ibn Abi Ibadah, Qais's dad, was a lover to Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt. He was the leader of the Khazraj tribe in Medina. You know in Medina there were two tribes, Aus Khazraj. Sa'ad ibn Ibadah was the leader of the Khazraj tribe. His son loved Imam Ali. Not just that, Imam Ali loved Qais as well. So he made him his representative in Azerbaijan. Imam Ali, in Nahj al sent him a letter. The last letter, not the sermons. You know Nahj al is divided into beautiful sta- statements, sermons, letters, and miscellaneous lovely quotes. In the letters portion of Nahj al the last one, it's a letter Imam Ali sends to Qais. Why is it the last one? It's the last letter of Imam Amir al-Mu'minin he wrote. He sent it to Qais, Ya Qais, I have only 10,000 men. That's it. You have 80,000 men in Azerbaijan. Bring them to me and let's go finish this man once and for all that's sitting in Sham. He has 400,000 soldiers the Imam will have a total of 90,000 men when he combines forces. 90,000 versus 400,000 is not at all even. 
but Imam Ali is leading them, so he should be good. So Qais says, done, I'm on my way. It takes a while for these many men to get here. Some people like to assume it was the holy month of Ramadan, and you can't kill during the month of Ramadan, hence that's why Imam Ali didn't fight him. No, no, he was just waiting for backup. On his way, Muawiyah gets word that 80,000 soldiers are coming to support Imam Ali. Imam Ali has 10,000, and now they're going to be 90. Muawiyah knows that's enough, because the soldiers Muawiyah has are nothing, especially in the presence of Imam Amir al Let's not forget that. Then he decides to create the following elaborate plan. Again, this is found by the work of Sheikh Hassan bin Farhan Maliki, Dr. Suhail Zakkar, and even the reference glimpses of Al-Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad in Tariq Damashq as well. And as well as we saw Tariq Al-Zahabi in addition. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, his Musnad, mentions the following narration. This is a Sahih Hadith, according to him. Imam Ali said, O oh people, do not be deceived by the man in Sham, i.e. Muawiyah. For if he ever feels weak and threatened, he will rely on, yista'een, rely on foreign forces to help him. Who are foreign forces? The Byzantium Empire, the Christian nation in Turkey, had re- relationships and diplomatic relations with Muawiyah. They had zero diplomatic relationships with Imam Ali. Imam Ali didn't make any recognition of them. Why? Because the Byzantium Empire didn't like Islam. On their coins, they purposely wrote in their dinar that there is no God but Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And he put his image, Constantine, on that, and he would stamp it. On purpose, he did so, so that the Muslims trade with currency that goes against their own tawheed. Imam Ali, as a result, what did he do? Imam Ali was the first in Islamic history to stamp the first Islamic currency. Before Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Muslims would use the dinar and dirham of the Christians, because that was the main currency reserve of the world. Imam Ali stamped the first Islamic coins, by the way. In the haram of Imam al-Ridha in Mashhad, you find some ancient currencies. One of them is attributed to the time period of Imam Ali. Do you know what it has written on it? By the Imam. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he made it haram to use the shirki coins. He's like, no, we're not using that one. Use this one instead. Whose economy does that threaten? Not Muawiyah's. Byzantium empires. So they didn't like Imam Ali. Another delil is that he didn't have any relationships with them diplomatically. In at tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad, which is a non-Shia work, there is a report that says, Imam made a pact with Muluk al-Sind. The kings of Sindh. What's Sindh? Sindh, I think, is like a region in the Pakistan area, towards the east. Muluk, the kings of Sindh, whereby we will never go to war with each other. How is that for a deal? They agreed with him. The India, Kashmir, Pakistan, that direction. Towards the east, he made agreements with the kings of that Sindhi area. Why? So that, if you notice, every single war Imam Ali faced came from where? The west, not the east. He didn't have a single battle or conflict in the East because he made a peace agreement with them. It's only self-proclaimed Muslims that put Ali as number four and they are willing to go to war with him. All his problems came from the West, from Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As and the likes as such. So he saw himself facing who? Amr ibn al-As in North Africa, that's one continent. The Byzantium Empire of East Europe, that's another continent. And the greater Levant of the Middle East by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, that's a third continent. They all gather together. Ali is going to come with whose soldiers? Qais ibn Sa'ad. And he's going to have 90. That's enough for Ali. Habibi, it was eight soldiers in the Battle of Hunayn against 4,000. Ali was one of them, and another lady was one of them, and Rasulullah, and they won that war. In the Battle of Uhud, it was down to about seven. And a lady was also one of them. But because Ali was there, Rasulullah didn't die. And Imam Ali fought. Ali has 90,000. What can he do? He can take over the world. Even if we have a million. Who cares? Baba, go back and pack your bags and leave. So we have to figure something out. What do we do? Muawiyah's number one tactic to get rid of anyone. If he wasn't facing them war one-on-one, what would he do? Poison them. Do you know who Muawiyah poisoned in his lifetime? Number one, Imam al-Hasan, alayhi salam. By Ju'da bint. Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais al-Kindi. Remember Al-Ash'ath? His daughter. He also poisoned Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, the famous Rawi, the muhaddith. 
He poisoned him because he found him threatening. He poisoned Abdul Rahman ibn Khalid ibn Walid because one day he asked his companions and Sir John, his confidant, Sir John al Rumi, Sir John the Roman from the Byzantine Empire. That's how close he was with them. Muawiyah's wife, Maysoon, Yazid's mom, was Christian as well. He had so many relationships with, relationships with them. Sir John said, when Muawiyah asked him, who do you think is the best qualified person to lead after me? Sir John said, Abdul Rahman ibn Khalid ibn al-Walid, his son, Khalid's son, is really good. Why? He's young, he's intelligent, he's smart. He's like, okay, the next day Muawiyah had him poisoned because he wants not anyone to threaten the Khilafah of his son Yazid. He poisoned so many people now he had to come and figure out a way to do the same to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he gathers with Amr ibn al-As. He figures out with the Byzantine Empire what to do. And they agreed on the following. Take someone who's willing to lay his life. Gather and bring him with a group of people. And so they brought about three people. Who were they? Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. In al Zahabi's tarikh, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim was registered as a soldier under Amr ibn al As after he had fought Imam Ali. Then joined the Khawarij, he went back to Egypt and became a soldier. So he was under Amr ibn al As, the right hand man of Muawiyah. Amr ibn al As supplied the soldier. The Byzantium Empire supplied the what? The poison. Muawiyah's poison, as Imam Ali says in Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal. If you find him getting weak, he will rely on foreign forces, meaning the Byzantiums, they have the best poison, a drop of which in a lake will kill all the animals in it. They supplied the poison, and in addition, the money and the women, Qutam, that famous lady. They all gathered, and they said, we need a hub in Kufa. Whose house? Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais al-Kindi, the same man that convinced everyone to go and follow the rule and agreement of Muawiyah about the arbitration. They all gather in his house, and they begin to plot as the home headquarters how to kill Abu Turab. They said, this was the 18th of the holy month of Ramadan, 18th yesterday. What goes on? Abdul Rahman bin Muljim, Al-Ash'ath sees something in him. He says, Abdul Rahman, you seem like you saw a ghost. Why do you look so yellow and scared? Why do you shiver? You know Abdul Rahman bin Muljim says? Supposedly he's a scholar, so he knows a hadith, muhaddith. He says, I heard a, a saying from Rasulullah. I, I learned it. He's like, what did you hear? He's like, I heard Rasulullah say that the one who will kill Ali, taqtuluhu ashqaha, like the one who killed the camel of Salih. Ali will die by ashq al-awwalina wal-akhirin. So he said, inni ashq, inni akhsha an akuna ashqaha. I fear to be the worst of them. Am I the one? You know what al-ash'ad did? No, that's a weak hadith. That hadith doesn't exist. No, it's not, it's not right. He convinced him otherwise. He's like, no, but I think I heard. Inni akhsha an akuna ashqaha. I fear to be the worst of them. Because I heard him say, ya Ali, يَقْتُلُكَ أَشْقَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ كَقَاتِلْ نَاقَتْ صَالِحْ Like the killer of the camel of Salih. And the camel of Salih in the Holy Quran, Allah calls it what? An ayah from Allah. The ayah of Allah. What about the biggest ayah to Allah? When who kills him will be the worst of the worst. al was like, no, it's a weak hadith, brother. Hassan al daif not sahih, majhul. He brings all this nonsense talk. And they bring this Qutam lady. You need to convince him. She says, how about I promise you a night with me? Just kill him. My mahar is the dem, the dem of Ali. Now it's all piling together. They need one more push. Abdul Rahman still is shaky. What does he do? Money comes in. Tariq al dhahabi records this. That money, 100,000 dinar. That's a lot. 100,000 gold coins come in from Egypt. From where? Amr ibn al-As. He has the money, he has the lady, he has the fake hadith, he has a goal in mind. And they said, you know what, don't do this alone. You're so nervous, just in case, just in case you decide to back out, here are two people with you. Who? Wardan ibn al-Mujalid, a Kharaji, and a man by the name of Shabib ibn Bajra. You remembered them today just now when you said, Allahumma al-an qatalat amir al-mu'minin. It's these three. So what does Qutam say? 
I'm going to. It's the 18th of Ramadan. Why? Tomorrow is the 19th. Why is this important? Because what do you do in the 19th of Shah Ramadan until the last Laytul Qadr? I'tikaf. So Qutam says, I'm going to bring a tent and bring it inside Masjid al Kufa and I will act like I'm doing I'tikaf. Why? Because I want to bring the swords inside the masjid. You can't bring a sword inside the masjid. So what do I do? I will act like I'm worshiping Allah and I'll hide the swords there. I have to put a tent. I'm a lady. No one, wants, no one can see me. So use that as a headquarters. She brought the poison. She brought the swords. She brought it all inside the masjid, hidden under the disguise of i'tikaf. Be careful of people that disguise haram work with halal work. Be careful of people that disguise haram work with halal work, whether it's someone saying, I'm going to worship Allah, and they use that as an excuse to take advantage of others, whether it's someone that uses a halal business, but uses the money to do what? Haram. Whether it's someone that takes advantage of others in ziyarah, and someone that looks at others and says, give me some wealth, and they use the wealth, I will donate it to sadaq and charity, and they use it to buy haram. Be careful of those that disguise the evil with the good. I will do this right now. The next day, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim says, I'm going to sleep outside Masjid al Kufa. And Qutam is inside the Masjid. To my left, Shabib ibn Bajra. To my right, Wardan ibn al Mujalid. And I will wait for Ali to walk inside the Masjid. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib decides that morning and that night before to spend it with who and whose house? His daughter, Lady Zainab al-Kubra, alayha salam. Imam Ali knows his demise. What goes on over here? Imam Ali one day breaks his fast. He was fasting. Ruhi lahu al-fida. And he, every single day, they would ask him, Ya Ali, your beard, it's white. Why don't you ever dye it? Imam Ali says, Hinna dyeing the beard to bring back youth is a form of beauty. And I, to celebrate would not be befitting. They said, why? Because I am in a state of Aza. Who are you mourning? I said, I'm mourning Rasulullah and Fatima al-Zahra. It's been 30 years. He says, I'm still mourning them. And don't worry. If you insist, it will be dyed. But not by any henna, not by any coloring. It'll be dyed red. Don't you worry. And then Amir al-Mu'mineen sits with his daughter, Lady Zainab. And he says to her, Zainab, I see the food you brought in front of me. There are more than three different colors here. Zainab, when have you seen me eat so luxuriously? She says, my father, I just want to make you food that I can say I did enough for you. He says, but I want to eat the same way the poorest of Kufa eat. I don't want to feel like I had something more than them. Take one of these away. She took a piece of bread away. And on that night, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen went to sleep, and he saw in his dream, and then he woke up, he looks at Imam al-Hassan, and he says to Sayyidah Zainab right next to her, him, and he says, I saw your grandfather, Rasulullah. And he said to me, Ali, we miss you. It's soon we will come and see you. Ali, your time is coming near, and your beloved are all waiting for you. Imam Ali says, then take me with you now. He said, shortly. When Imam Amir al-Mu'minin says this to Sayyidah Zainab, Sayyidah Zainab says to Imam al-Hassan, Ya Hassan, tell him not to go to the masjid then. Imam Hassan says, Father, where are you going to be heading? He says, I'm heading to the masjid to pray. He says, Father, let this be a night you don't head there. He says, no. It is by Allah the night that my beloved Rasulullah has foretold and spoken to me about. As Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, on a night like tonight, on the 19th of holy month of Ramadan, exits his home. The orphans await Imam Ali to deliver them some food. Imam Ali tends to the orphans. After that, the Imam proceeds to head towards Masjid al-Kufa. When he passes by one of the neighbors, he had some geese and birds in his lawn. They began to flap their wings and make much noise. 
The neighbor says, forgive me, commander of the faithful. I don't know why they decide to do this in front of you. He says, let them be. They're trying to prevent a tragedy soon. Ya Ali, even they know you're right. As Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen made his way to Majdid al-Kufa, he began to wake up those sleeping around the masjid. He began to wake up one after the other, getting ready for a salah, until he approached Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam. Imam Ali says, O oh Abdul Rahman, do not sleep the way you are sleeping, for you are sleeping in the manner of shaitan. He was sleeping on his stomach. Rather sleep on your right, for that is the sleep of the smart. Rather sleep on your back, that is the sleep of the prophets. And if you like, I can tell you what you are hiding under your cloak. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim gets up. Imam Amir al Mu'mineen enters the masjid. Imam then climbs the mahrab and he begins to make the last and final adhan. Imam Ali would make the adhan every morning during the holy month of Ramadan. This would be his last and final adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. As Imam Amir al Mu'minin enters the mihrab he began to perform his nafila of salat al-fajr qutam as she is hiding in the back begins to arm wardan ibn al-mujalid she then hands a sword sharpened by her own hands drenched in this poison to shabib ibn bajra and she gives the sharpest one to abdul rahman ibn muljim and they decide to walk behind the imam they begin to hide behind the pillar as Imam Amir al Mu'mineen enters in his Salah Allahu Akbar as the Imam then begins to recite his Fatiha and then he begins to recite his Ikhlas Imam Amir al Mu'mineen does his last and final Ruku' and he is the one Allah praised his Raka'ah wa yuqimoon as wa Imam Amir al Mu'minin gets down to perform his sajda. As he raises his head, he goes to perform his second sajda. And at that moment, Abdul Rahman and his accomplices begin to run towards Imam Ali. One of them raises his sword and misses the Imam. The other one raises and hits the top of the mihrab. Unless until Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim raises his sword with all his energy and strikes the head of Imam Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, saying, Al Hukmu lillah, la laka ya Ali. What did Imam Ali say? Fustu wa rabb al Kaaba. Someone else also called out, but from the heavens, Jibra said, Tahaddamat wallah. أركان الهدى وانفصمت العروة الوثقى قتل أتقل أدقيا قتله أشغل أشقيا قتل ابن عم المصطفى قتل عليا المرتضى The pillars of هدى have now been severed Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen falls to the ground gushing with blood from his head and they begin to run away they can't
حج ام عبد الرحمن الامام امير المؤمنين اذا انهوا ضيسا امام الحسن عليه السلام as the imam was standing by his son they began to stand and they immediately returned home imam ali says to imam al hasan with blood pouring profusely over his head my son hasan allow me to stand straight he says why my father he says i don't want my daughter zainab to see me in this state ya ali you didn't want zainab to see you with blood from one strike on your head how about when she saw the twelves of shimar ibn dhul jawshan on the head of imam al hussein ma'tam al hussein ya hussein 